Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is one of our second or third seminars we're having, and this is going to be on earthquakes. And so, with much further ado, I'd just like to introduce you to um, uh, uh, Elena. Elena is a registered nurse, and she's done some volunteer work with City Council, uh, Vancouver City Council. She's done a course in the emergency response with Institute of Justice in New Westminster. And she's amazingly enthusiastic and passionate about what she does. Uh, she just related to me now, she's just come back from Greece and Turkey, and she's been fascinated with the, the masjids there, and she'll give us a little snippet of that. So I'm just going to let her say a few words, and then I will just show you a snippet of a YouTube on uh, earthquakes, and then we'll go with the representation. Thank you. Good evening. I am so happy to be here. My trip to Greece and Turkey was um, okay. the best trip I've ever had. And I say that about every country I go to, but Turkey and the people were just outstanding. And I visited many a mosque, talked to many young people about their faith, and it was just very heartwarming, so I am really happy to be here with you and uh, would enjoy having some uh, time with you after the presentation as well. Thank you. Okay, we're just gonna, I'm just going to show a snippet of a, uh, a video on earthquakes. Uh, it revolves around the prediction or the most likelihood that we are going to have an earthquake. And there's no doubt about that. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. Scientists have already said it's long overdue. So this one will give you the scientific background. I don't want to scare you, but this is the reality. Sorry, this is the one that just gives you the... Uh, earthquake! 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 Pacific Northwest, I'd be considering moving. Seriously. The gist of it is this. 
The federal government estimates 13,000 Americans will die in a major earthquake and tsunami in the Pacific Northwest. It's not a question of weather, but when. This earthquake is coming, and it's overdue. Reporting the most popular article on the New Yorker's website is rattling many Americans. The really big one examines the Titanic earthquake and tsunami, <coughs> not where you might imagine. They fall on called the Cascadia subduction zone runs for 700 miles off the Pacific Northwest coast. Experts think it will trigger the worst natural disaster in North America's history, and it is overdue. It's predicted to be worse than Hurricane Katrina, worse than the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Scientists and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, are warning of a pending doom for the Pacific Northwest. An earthquake along a little known fault line that would kill thousands and affect millions. Consider that the magnitude 9.0 earthquake in Japan, just a few years ago, remember that? Killed more than 15,000 people in the north of Japan and injured thousands of others. Seismologists say that the quake that will strike on our Pacific Northwest coastline should be even stronger, at up to a 9.2. They call such a quake a margin rupture quake, and it's every bit as bad as it sounds. Here's the reason for it. Our entire continent sits on the North American tectonic shelf, right? Plate, I should say. Off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, from the top of Washington State, all the way down to Northern California. This is it. And another plate called the Juan de Fuca is trying to slide up under North America, but it's it's stuck. We have an illustration over here in the big wall. Let me show you what this is. This is our continent here. These the this is the, the Cascadia Mountains. This is the Cascadia. What do they call it? The Cascadia what? The Cascadia Bridge. I, I was actually asking him, but thank you. The North American plate here and the Juan de Fuca plate here. This one's sliding up under, and eventually this is going to go down, send a huge wall of water up. That wall will go all the way over to Japan, and the other will come onto our, onto our shore within 15 minutes. And when it slips, it will unleash not only a colossal earthquake, but also that tsunami. 700 miles long, and in some places up to a 100-foot high wall of water and whatever it's pushing, like houses and dump trucks and, and, and schools. Thousands and thousands will not escape. The New Yorker quotes a FEMA official who says, and I quote, our operating assumption is that everything west of Interstate 5 will be toast. Everything west of Interstate 5 is gone. That's Seattle, Tacoma, Portland and Olympia, Salem and Eugene wiped out. Altogether about 7 million people. That's not including tourists. So think of summertime. The New Yorker reports that FEMA calculations indicate the disaster will damage or destroy about a million buildings, including 3,000 schools and one-third of all fire stations. And perhaps the worst part of all of this, these sorts of earthquakes happen at regular intervals in exactly this part of the world, have forever. On average, according to seismologists, about every 240 years. So when was the last one of these? These massive 9.2 or so earthquakes? Well, the last one was more than 300 years ago, the year 1700. It struck in the Pacific Northwest and sent a 600-foot wave of water all the way to Japan. So right now, on average, the Pacific Northwest is decades overdue for the really, really big one.
will reach between 8.7 and 9.2 on the Richter scale and cause a tsunami. Airmen and soldiers conduct joint training in Washington to support domestic operations in preparation for a natural disaster. As president of the Portland Post of the Society of American Military Engineers, I felt a real need, a real desire to mobilize engineers to help better prepare our region for the Cascadia earthquake. Army and Air Guard elements successfully operate in a joint mission environment. The only way to move supplies and support to stranded residents in need after such an event would be by air. It's really great to see the state move in a direction of supporting domestic operations at this level. It allows us to really be much more dynamic and respond to the state to it. The last big one was 315 years ago. We think the cycle time is roughly 240 years. Do the math. We are overdue in this calculation with another big one. We've known about the Cascadia subduction zone for quite a while. It's a serious risk. A big earthquake in the Pacific Northwest it could be the worst disaster the country has faced uh, historically. Thank you for that starting bit, uh, because it's really important to have good information, because what information does, it, it motivates us for preparation. Fear paralyzes us into inaction, and we think well, it's going to happen tomorrow, or further than that, and we don't do anything about it. And the purpose of this presentation, as volunteers of the city, and my background, as was mentioned earlier, I'm also a nurse and I'm trained in, in emergency management, is how important preparation is. Because prep what preparation does, it takes away the fear. The fear can still be there, but it, it, if, it's like learning to drive a car. When you start, you're, you're afraid, there's so much to learn, it's um, over, overpowering. But once you are accustomed to it and you've practiced, it becomes familiar and you forget about it. That's the same thing with preparation. And though we focus on an earthquake here, the preparation means for any kind of disaster. We also work in the city. The province has a program where in, if there's a fire, for example, if there was a fire here or a fire in an apartment or a hotel, we, we will be called out and we will look after the people who are impacted for the first 72 hours. And it's that preparation, if there's a fire, do you know what you need to take with you? If there's an earthquake, do you have something to take with you? Because you truly do not know how long you may be out of your home be it a fire, be it an earthquake, and what's your preparation. So this process just starts you thinking, and if you take nothing away from tonight, is you are personally responsible as flying in an airplane. You put the face mask or the oxygen on yourself first, and then you put it on, be it who, family or children or, or seniors, Whoever is in your family or friend network, you look after them second. 
because if you aren't able to function, they can't function either, if you're the sole person who's in charge of that family unit. So those are the things to remember as we're preparing. <clears throat> As the video that we watched, disasters happen, and we've all seen disasters of various form and nature in the media. And these are just some pictures of. What we're going to do tonight is we'll identify some of the hazards, uh, some of the key things to take away from tonight is having a meeting place, having an out of area contact. Uh, what do the kits look like? We have a sample here. Uh, how much food and water do you need in preparation? Uh, looking at home, looking at work, looking at your vehicle, uh, looking at pets, uh, and then of course how do you practice your plan. <clears throat> Has anyone here been in an earthquake? And where where were you in an earthquake? I was in, in the apartment back home in Egypt. In Egypt? I was like a kid. Okay. Yeah. But it leaves its impact, doesn't it? Yeah. There were some buildings falling. Mm -hmm. Was anyone, did anyone experience the quake in December? So what what did you experience? Well, not the first. And what did you think first when? I knew it's an Okay. Because I've been in the perfect before. Mm -hmm. I had the same experience when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. That one was more scary because I saw the whole closet moving. Mm -hmm. uh, back home we had like, uh, wooden windows outside the glass windows. Mm -hmm. uh, the walls, so that was scary to see the whole room going back. Mm -hmm. Did anyone think of the, uh, the the earthquake here? If you haven't experienced an earthquake, often when people will think, oh, somebody's hit my building, uh, did a car run into. That was, and I've been in an earthquake in LA, uh, it was about 4.8, I think. Uh, but this one, my first thought was, it was a thud, and I live on the seventh floor of a high rise, and it was like, oh, what was that? And so your brain takes time to assess what it is, and if it's a major earthquake, you want to have some preparation so you're not spending that time thinking, what is it? That you're acting instead, so that's really the, the key. Anyone else in an earthquake experience? Well, Toronto, but we're uh, just in a office having a meeting, and the, fl the floor just went like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm in denial going, that's near the subway, but we're not near the subway, and then I just blew it off. Mm -hmm. And we just continued the meeting. And mm -hmm. later on, we learned it was a six. So uh, you don't believe you're in an earthquake because you yes. don't recognize it. And later on, it's like, well, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. That's a reason why um, uh, an the engineering department in, in, at UBC, Dr. Carlos Ventura, and uh, some of his colleagues have put, it, put together an early warning system, and they, they've actually been hired to put it into the Catholic schools in uh, the greater Vancouver region, and they've done that, and they're putting it into some of the other schools as well. What he said, and it's only, I think, a 10 second warning, but it's enough that if you hear that sound, you know that it's time to act. You don't stop and think, what is it? Uh, and that's the time we waste in, what is it? Uh, because it's just human nature, it can't possibly be. Unless, of course, you've been in an earthquake, then, then you're, you're definitely, you've had that practice, you're definitely more cognizant of it. Any other um, disaster experiences in the room? In Vancouver, the previous day this happened a long time, and it was definitely like 
for the audience. I, I observed it very right away. I know it's worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any plan, like you said, that uh, you guys having some plan warning system? Not, not in the city per se. The province is looking at that as well. Um, the nature of preparedness in an area that hasn't had a major disaster. In Canada, our largest disaster has been in Fort McMurray, evacuating the city of 80,000 people. So preparation for us and money for preparation is kind of some money comes, but it's it's going to happen over there. So politically, we do not. It's the nature of politics and it's the nature of human nature. It's not going to happen on my watch, so I'm not going to allocate as much budget towards that. Uh, it's areas that have had an earthquake where governments and corporations or companies will put much more effort towards preparation. Um, I was in Armenia a couple of years ago and we went and they had a major quake, I think it was in 1997. Their police department was leveled, their fire department was leveled, their military, and it took three days for Bogota to break the military. And meanwhile, people were just terrified, frightened, hospital, they, I think the hospital had five units and three units were standing and two units were damaged and they just had to work through the system. Uh, but what the Red Cross had done there is they had worked really hard with citizens, both in age groups from 16 to 24 and then adults. The training level was much higher than areas that haven't experienced a quake. So what, what happened in that situation is neighbors got together, they did search and rescue, and they also did uh, supplies, and they did safety and security because there was no safety and security. And, and that's really another of the key things that we teach is uh, preparing your family, preparing yourself, and then also looking at your neighborhood. And the neighborhood can can be geographic, or it can be based on interest. It can be based on faith, wh whatever. So that there's there's community of people looking after each other. Anybody been in a major fire? Uh, and someone in much younger than me has added zombie attacks onto the list, but... Uh, what is that? What is zombie attacks? <laughs> so, to start with is uh, designate wherever you live, if you live in an apartment, a home, a condo, a townhouse, it doesn't matter. Designate who if you live alone, for example, work with your neighbor to say, okay, if something happens, if it's a fire, if it's an earthquake, where will we meet? So that everybody in that unit that you belong to knows where you're going to meet. Outside, away from power lines, hopefully, if there's uh, an open space, that's where you go to. Uh, once the quake is over and everyone then you can account for at that point in time. Uh, and, and be sure everybody knows where that is because you don't know where everybody's going to, going to be. Somebody may be at work, somebody may have gone out, uh, someone else may have been home, you don't know that. Another key area, and this is an important takeaway, is have an out-of-area contact. We take so much of our connectivity now totally for granted. We may not have that connectivity. And not only may we not have it, we would ask you not to overuse it. Because in that situation, in a major disaster, what we need is whatever bandwidth is available, we'll need it for emergency purposes. 
with an out and area contact, if lines and, and that with bandwidth is restricted here, you might be able to call out, you might be able to text. So the key is everyone in your family unit knows who the other contact contact is, the phone number to be easily accessible and listed. If it even if even preferably is having a contact out of country because you just don't know connection and how you'll be able to connect with people. So what happens if your family unit, say you have 10 people in your family unit, and maybe there's only three of you that meet in the uh, meeting place that happen home, and the other seven are school, work, whatever, and you may not be able to contact them. But they may be able to call out and the out of area contact then would, would know who is still missing and they would be able to know who to contact to see where potentially those people might be more easily than you might be able to in the local situation. Or you may not be able to make the contact as well. You may have been injured, but everyone then knows where that is. And that is, that is really important uh, piece to, to add to your plan. Emergency kits. What sorts of things do you think should be in your kit besides what I have out here? <clears throat> Water, yes. Mm -hmm. So lights. Mm -hmm. First aid. First aid, yes. And I also with first aid recommend for anyone who can, if you don't have it, take a first aid course. Our fire department is excellent. They teach the Red Cross system. It's $60 for a, a basic first aid course. Uh, first responders will not be available for small, um, small injuries. They may not be available even for large injuries. We don't know because their focus will be on where the greatest in injuries are and where the greatest need is. It may not be in your neighborhood. What else? I see some glasses. Uh, the key in glasses is when you fill your prescription, take your old prescription and put it into your kit. Uh, because you don't know what might happen to your glasses and then you've got that extra pair. What about money? Some cash might help because within an earthquake the electricity might not. Yes. There may be no banks available. Uh, and what we recommend is taking anywhere from 25 to 50, and some people say more depending on your family unit, in $5 bills. Uh, because it's easy to cash and it's easily accessible. If you have it in your kit and you spend it, replace it, make certain that that gets replaced. Because uh, those are kinds of things that you don't think of. What about important documents? What kinds of documents might you need in your kit? Are these an insurance? Or are you... Insurance? I'm sorry, what was? Identification, driver's license. Will you be able to uh, boot it up and, and all those kinds of things potentially are a problem. If you have a flash drive, I also would recommend you have a hard copy. Uh, I, for example, a number of years ago had my uh, purse stolen on the, on the ferry. I was just carrying um, a briefcase and had it, didn't have it sent. I get home and it's missing. I went to get my driver's license. I had no ID. Couldn't get my driver's license. And so I said, what do I do? Do I walk out of here and drive without a driver's license? Which I did, which I wasn't legally wasn't supposed to. But that's the kinds of things, if you have nothing to show them, uh, you have to go and get something else before you can get your driver's license. Insurance, if you have insurance for it, and, and of course, 
We recommend insurance always investigate what's happening with the insurance industry, which is challenging because of disasters. Things like earthquake uh, are costly, but it's, it's important to evaluate that piece for yourself and see if that makes sense for you or not. Uh, but if you have at least basic insur insurance, be sure you have those copies. Medical records, if there's, if there's some key things for uh, records that you need, then, then have copies of that. If you have prescription drugs, talk to your doctor and see what you can do to either have a prescription, again, it may be challenged to get filled, you don't know the pharmacies, what degree that would be available. Also, the challenge of hospital units uh, will be very impacted. So for you to go to a hospital with something that isn't life-threatening, uh, the wait now is long. Can you imagine if the city's impacted? It will be much longer. So the key in, in your kit is take anything that is important to you that if you couldn't function within your home, that you at least have it for 72 hours or three days. When we work with seismologists and scientists who know this area, and as, as the previous video showed, they say they prepare for two weeks. And even that, they think, isn't going to be enough. But if you do at least a little, what that little does, it takes away the fear and gives you some comfort in knowing if something's happening. OK, I, uh, my bag is over there. I can take that with me. Um, and I'm going to be OK for a short period. And when we go through the kits, we'll go through the home uh, as well, because that's a, uh, a different area. Uh, what else might we need in the kit? Glasses, money, papers, medication we talked about. What about food? Yeah, I have some food that uh, we can like, save it for three days. That can save us uh, anything happens. Oh, okay. like cans. Yes, uh, cans, dried food. Um, in in a, a small grab and go kit, people will often put things like um, power bars. Though I caution about power bars from my nursing background is be aware of sugar and be aware of salt. Sugar will make you hungry hungrier doesn't it gives you a, a quick hit just like coffee and a donut does in the morning and then suddenly you crash and you're hungry it's because it gives a burst in insulin uh, but it's kind of a false burst and and then you're hungry or you run out of energy again uh, better things that have some protein to them uh, nuts are good to to have and you can always rotate those items through your kit as well. Uh, canned things, canned in your larger at home preparation kit is definitely good. And if you have cans, you have to think of things like can openers and uh, that sort of thing. Okay. What else? Have we missed anything else? So is it uh, prepared uh, as if yeah, you're out of your house or you're inside the house but you're cut off? Uh, the first the first grab and go, go kit is I have to leave my home for whatever reason, though we're talking about earthquake, and I won't be able to get back in for three days. Uh, that's how that is looked at. The home kit is a much larger kit and we'll get into that in a moment. So you need something to keep you warm. Mm -hmm. If you're going to stay outside your house. Yes. So, so any advices about this? Well, uh, there, there, again, it's, it's, we recommend look at it personally as to what your comfort zone is. 
Uh, also looking at volume, things like the, uh, the thin aluminum blankets, which for warmth are good, having a rain poncho, having something uh, light. If uh, merino wool, for example, I, I travel with merino wool, and it's very light, and having an extra one in your bag for change is good, um, because you, again, you don't know what the weather's going to be like, what time of year uh, it might happen. If you have a rain poncho, that's always good considering in our climate. Uh, gloves for, you don't know if you're gonna have to move some debris. Uh, and again, you can personalize uh, those kinds of things. Radio is something we haven't talked about. Um, that may be the only means of communicating. Uh, hopefully the radio stations, because their powers are high, we at this point choose to believe that they will be standing and that will be, you'll be able to turn it into uh, 81.1 CBC, which is the national broadcaster who will carry most of the information. And, and so it's having a crank radio uh, or a battery. Just like that sort of thing. With water, having a small amount of water, again, that in that pack is going to last you perhaps for, for three days. You might be able to access water on the street from a water tap. Put your own kit together or 
you can buy them. And, and that's really that personal choice and the resource choice. So you can, you can choose. The thing with the first aid kit is to remember you may not have any resources available for you. All the resources we take for granted now. Uh, calling 911, um, that is an area that people call without thinking. Uh, the December earthquake that we had what happened with 911, their greatest number of calls were, is this an earthquake? And what that does, when there, when there isn't a major disaster, it's okay. But if there's a major disaster, it's tying up lines. Mm -hmm. Seattle had, when Seattle had the quake, they, their lines were crashed because of the calls that were coming in asking about the earthquake. So that's the kind of thing you don't want to do. You want to make your out of area contact, check on your family once you're out of your building, and then uh, if you can text, text, but basically restrict your phone calls and listen to the radio. Batteries are running low. children here? Important questions if your children are in school that you are aware of what the school has done. Most of the schools will have a comfort kit for each child and that's the responsibility of the parent and it's usually stored in a facility like in a container outside the school. But it's important to ask those questions and then also talk with your children or your child that they know what the, the situation is. The schools are more geared overall on terrorist attacks than they necessarily are on earthquake. But that's an important piece to make certain that is is taken care of and that you're aware of and that your child is trained. similar kit to what you have uh, at home as a grab-and-go because you don't know where you're going to be. If you're going to school, for example, your backpack should have, you, you aren't going to carry all of that because again we take into the common sense piece, but it should have at least some things that are important to you. It should have some water, it should have some, some food, some, some lightness to it but some reality to it as well. Who lives in a single family dwelling? Okay. The, the key, and there's a really good sheet at the back, um, and I recommend you take one um, on each of the sheets. When you're looking at, be it a home or be it an apartment, look up. Hear what might come down. <laughs> um, odds are quite good that everything. And so when you're at home, look what's up and what should maybe come down. We, we do storage actually from a common sense point of view. Usually in a kitchen, stuff that's lighter is higher, pots and pans and stuff that's heavier is lower. You can choose to put latches on doors to keep the doors closed. You know, when the, when the shake is happening, the doors fly and stuff comes out. Uh, I was surprised in the December quake, I had a plant on a shelf, oh, a little, covered about half this table, about this high, and the plant was on top, the plant fell off. And that really wasn't, that was, what was it, six something? I forgot. 
Stop. It's not spinning. It would be spinning. Actually, it would be going really rapidly if okay. it was leaking, um, because it's using using. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so smell, visible. There's a third one. I forgot what the third one is. Or if you actually, it actually knew that there was a a, a break in the line. Uh, and, and you would only turn it off in those instances because if you turn your gas meter off or your, your uh, gas source off, you cannot turn it back on. And so if you're in a major disaster, you will have to wait for a gas uh, technician to come to your home to turn it on. So if you don't need to turn it off, you don't turn it off. That's our recommendation. The gas companies uh, tell us as well. And and that is even in our. Uh, I live in. There's probably uh, maybe 100 units in the building I live in, and I've mentioned it to management. And um, most people don't know where the services are, and you think that management will be available to take care of you, you don't know that. You don't know if they're going to be home. You don't know if they're, they're injured. So everybody living in a condo, apartment, um, complex should know where all these things are. So we've talked about heavy objects. We've talked about water. Uh, what else might be heavy? What's what? Is, what is an item that most many people and I see some uh, some of them here. They're not. Um, you have shoes in them. What do most homes have? In them? 
books. Bookcases are, are heavy and would fall if you have bookcases, if you can secure them to the wall, that's something we recommend because they will fall. about smoke alarms? What else do we need besides a smoke alarm in, in a home? And a smoke alarm, we look at it from, from a fire standpoint. And it, it, smoke alarm is a good example. Uh, our fire department, and we work with them in, in small fires, the firemen will have a fire alarm in every room in the house. Because they have experienced fires and they see what happens when there isn't one or perhaps there, there is one but it doesn't cover uh, and somebody doesn't get out. So they've seen the consequences of being unprepared and they will recommend having one. In. They will choose to have one in every room. They don't recommend it because the standard is have one for your living space. <coughs> Uh, make certain it's operating and make certain you've checked that the batteries are, are working uh, and that it, it works. What do, I'm, does anyone do what my husband does in our place if there is an activation of a smoke alarm? Take the battery out. I usually get them to put it back in once. Uh, buzzing and the noise subsides, but it's human nature not to want to sort of deal with the noise of it. Uh, but uh, the noise is important, it's there for a reason. Also th things like how are you going to get out of your home, and this can be very simple, and you can take for granted that you're going to know where to go, but if you have more than yourself to look after, and there's more than one entrance in your home, what is the exit entrance that all of you will choose? Emergency exits. Uh, emergency exits. Uh, also, if it's a house and say there's three exits, uh, you know, downstairs, upstairs, whatever, and people may be in different areas, but if there's a common and part of that is just getting our brain to think from a planning standpoint and say, okay, we're all going to marshal out to this point, and here's how we're going to go to get there. And it's a practice thing that, that in a disaster, when we're panicking, we have practice and we know what we're going to do in that situation. What about fire extinguishers? Does everybody have a fire extinguisher in their home? What would you do if you had a um, hot fat fire on your stove? How would you put it out? You will use blankets. Or if there is a close uh, fire extinguisher and if you are living in a condo, you can bring one. Okay. And what kind of fire extinguisher would you use? Would you use dry? Would you use water? Water is usually not a good idea unless it is mixed with CO2. But and and why would water not work? It depends. Just like if the fire goes oh, from oil, you. the water will ruin this. Yeah, the water will will yeah. make the fire bigger. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, cover it. What? Uh, anything to to uh, stop the fire. Yeah, mostly blanket will work. Mm -hmm. Or a lid if it's a pot, a lid yeah. um, of that nature. Just for information, for if you if you use a lid, don't just like force it to blow it, because that can make an extra pressure for the fire. Yes, yes. So it's better just like to sweep it like that. Mm -hmm. Have you had experience? Uh, I want videos. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, the visual always helps in our learning process. Exactly. So if there's children or seniors or people with disability in your family unit, it's important that their needs are addressed 
and uh, then they, they're, they're assisted specifically. Each person is responsible for what they can do. And it's important to empower them uh, within that process. Children are very good and very bright and it's important that you take them through a calm process of if something happens, if we have to leave our, our home, this is what we do. Uh, you don't have to create fear, but you create preparedness through the process of education. Pets, that's, uh, again, does anybody have pets here? Then I won't spend that time. Uh, practicing your plan, it's, uh, and the sheets have a handout which you can go through and, and personalize your own, your own plan. We talk of, of doing that twice a year when the time changes. You can check on all your supplies that you have. Are they current? Uh, you can change your water. You can check your fire alarm. Um, you can check that the phone number is still current for your out of area contact. Uh, you can practice what would happen if the event was happening in that moment, and all of the family unit would go through that little protocol of that practice. So before I turn quick, <clears throat> the, the key is not to get injured by something falling on you. Um, be prepared, stock up, because you may not have access to all the things we take for granted here. Uh, talk with your own family unit, talk with your neighbors, talk with your community. Um, and then check that all your supplies are current and valid for that emergency. Now we had, uh, I think, uh, a little bit on the video, but uh, if an earthquake, if the shaking was to happen, where, what would you do right now? Uh, say there's an earthquake, <clears throat> what would you do? Okay, there's a table here, and there's how many of us? Oh, there's another one there. There's one there. Mm, we might read. We might. We might not. Say some of us could get under the table. Some could not. Those that couldn't get under a table, what would they do? With the doorways, with the corners. Doorways are protocols that were encouraged before the construction of today that we have, especially in North America. So doorways is no longer something we recommend. Uh, you can still use a doorway, not saying no, but that's not something we recommend necessarily. The key thing in an earthquake is to prepare your head to, uh, for safety, is to protect your head, pardon me. Uh, so if you have nothing to go under, if the doorway is the only thing available, and you know something isn't going to come flying at you, is that you've covered your head and protected it, or you can even go under a chair. Uh, the key, bones will heal, brains take a little longer. And, and so that's the thing to remember in an earthquake is um, protecting your head. So it doesn't matter where it is or what it is, uh, is protecting the head. If you have nothing that you can go under, then just use your arms and, and cover your, your head. Then what would you do? The shaking's happening and you're under a table. What would you do at that point? You stay until the earthquake is over and uh, wait for an extra, uh, I don't remember, 30 seconds? Yes. To make sure that there's no second relief? Mm -hmm. No aftershocks. No aftershocks. As, as soon as you, we say drop, cover, and hold, that's our sort of protocol. When you drop and cover and you're holding, start counting 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. It does a number of things. It distracts you from what's going on. 
It keeps you busy in your mind. And it gives you the length of time that earthquake is happening. So you'll know the severity of it by the time that you've had to count. And the longer you've had to count, the greater chance there is of aftershocks as well. So it gives you that little bit of information. It's not um, a huge, it's not huge in accuracy, but it gives, it, it, it distracts your mind and gives you some information. <clears throat> And then you wait for that 30 seconds, and then you get up, get up and assess what the situation is. If you're in a family unit, or you're at work, or you're at school, when you're counting, count together. And it keeps everybody in the same sort of space uh, and focused on the same, same um, uh, length of time, so it's reassuring. So how many would, in, what often happens is people instinctively think, okay, there's an earthquake, uh, I'm going to run and get out of the building because something may drop and hurt me. But the studies that have been done is, and that's why the pro protocol of drop, cover, and hold is more injuries happen running out of the buildings than staying in the buildings till the earthquake is over. Once the earthquake is over and it's safe, go to your meeting place, assess, grab your kit if you can, go outside, uh, you grab a roll bag, and go outside and then assess things uh, and, and see where your family unit is. So, we ask you to take, take away the important things that uh, we said is the knowledge that you have from tonight is personal responsibility. Do not expect that the city will be there for you in the first three days, and it might be longer. So the, the importance is you have your own you've taken care of yourself and you've taken care of your family unit. And then hopefully you'll be able to take care of your neighborhood collectively as well because the first responders will not be.